Augustine himself has talked about the ununderstandability, the incomprehensible nature of the Trinity. It's the ultimate mystery, right? In fact, I think that the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the Catechism says, is the central mystery of the Christian faith. It is the most mysterious, most eyes not seen, ears not heard. Hence the grand hope of the beatific vision. You'll see God as he is and like can understand it. And in your glorified, resurrected body, be given the grace to, under, to comprehend the glory of that. And you want to look at nothing else for all eternity because it's so glorious and grand. Um, last point, guys. Last point, 289. I'm done. I'm going to throw this book up in the air. I promise I'll do it. I'm going to throw this book up in the air and, and try to do this. It'll be so sick. I'm going to throw it up in the air to signify a closing. It'll leave the screen and hopefully it'll descend back down to the screen. That'll be so sweet. I'll see if I can pull it off. Last thing I'm doing before I throw the book. Signs and Sacraments, Betsy, page 289, second paragraph, 28. All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. That's where I want to finish. All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. A third time, I will read it. I do declare it. Whoa. All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. It worked. And I'm actually coming to you on Friday, the 20th, September 20th. One of the great advantages, a kind of awesome, obvious point, an awesome advantage, I think, but something that's so duh, whatever, is that obviously with video splicing and um, whatever else you may call it, uh, video editing, moving stuff around, of course, into the cohesive whole as it's posted later on as you're watching it now, I can move many disparate, disparate parts around, right? And I'm glad I'm doing this on Friday and you'll see my, my clothes will change at some point. We'll have the whole room full, full of people and all that kind of stuff at some point in the stream. That part, the normal and the lights will be on and be super illuminated. I love the kind of dark ambiance, but we'll have the lights on, the kind of normal background setting. That will be the true maple syrup number, um, whatever it is, 308 or 309. <laughs> I've already forgotten. But... Um, in, in, in the year of St. Augustine number seven, that'll be the true full stream in class closing out this book, right? We're going from book 10 through book 13, pages 221 to 306, end of the book. But I'm also, I'm, I'm doing this thing on Friday here for the purpose of just kind of letting everyone know, like if you just have that long stream that we normally watch, um, the normal Monday class, that's great. That's the kind of, bread and butter but on fridays there's this option of having this kind of review period and going over different stuff and hello we have a guest erica uh, feel free to turn the lights on or keep them off whatever um we have this period of review on friday where we go over what we discuss in the most immediate week and so that's what i want to do today and it's perfect timing i could not have like hired you to come in at a more perfect time than <laughs> than right now so yeah, what I was simply telling everyone was we'll spend this today. You got did you get my email in the flock note about the, the adjusted time? Um yes, I did. Good, sweet, perfect. Yeah, because also everyone watching online later too, this is kind of irrelevant and um it doesn't matter because it's just posted at a certain time. But normally we meet at nine o'clock. We're here at eight twenty five right now. Eight twenty five to about eight forty, I guess, fifteen minutes. So without further ado, I'm just going to ask you some questions because like I said, uh, come Monday, we're going to finish out. We're going to finish out Confessions, book 11 through 13. I want to go over some of the stuff that we talked about in the previous episode, books 6 through 10. And once more, just kind of in this long rambling um, <laughs> introduction today, invite everyone to consider if you can't make the long class on Monday to come as our wonderful guest has for a kind of brief Cliff Notes review. All right, so without further ado, um, where did we start last class? Let me see, we started on page, page 90, right? Book six, Secular Ambitions and Conflicts. 
And the full discussion of this was, was already done, so you can kind of revisit that. But you know, what are some main points that we teased out? By the way, FYI, looking ahead to the, the next one, to the final close, we're, talk, we're going to talk a lot about Augustine's concept of time and God being outside of time and the concept of eternity, not as endless time, but the absence of it, right? The kind of eternal frozen now kind of thing. Boethius will talk a lot about this too. Um, God as, you know, in the eternal now. Erica, he talks about his friend, Olypius. He goes and gets really into gladiator stuff. Comments. There he had been seized by an incredible obsession for gladiatorial spectacles, and to an unbelievable degree, he imbibed madness. That's one of the things we talked about. What are your thoughts on gladiatorial contests in the ancient Roman world? So that's definitely not particularly within um, my expertise, but um, I guess what stands out from that part of the confessions is, um, I guess particularly the way they're watching it for the spectacle, and um, getting drawn into that, and that plays in sort of what Augustus yeah. on Confucius and that I for sure. Excellent. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I made the comparison last class. There's almost something like pornographic about this, that Olypius is obsessed with, he has this bloodlust, right? He wants to see these people killed in live action. And I, I think your point is excellent. I think you're exactly right. It's this concupiscent desire to take these things to full fruition, of which I think the church wisely reminds us to avoid the near occasion of sin, Right. Olypius is like, well, I'll, you know, I don't want to go see this stuff. This is like messed up, right? This is bad. Okay, you know, I'll go, but I'll close my eyes. I can handle it. I can, I'll be in the close proximity, but I'll just close my eyes and things will be cool. And then finally he goes completely off the rails, right? Like he, he can't, he hears everything going on. He hears the, the fighting and stuff and he opens his eyes and vibes madness, goes nuts. And then has a long time, like someone overcoming an addiction to anything of getting kind of rid of this awful of this awful habit. But I think you're exactly correct. I think in that part of the, the midsection, remember, the, uh, Monday's class is Confessions 3 of 3, our third discussion. This is the review of the second one. So the middle part of the book, page 90 through 220, those middle books, 6 through 10. I think that's a huge point, as you said. It's this kind of like using uh, even someone else's experience. Because he's always talking about himself, right? He, his inability to rid himself of personal lust and lust in the classic sense that other friends struggle with these things too, and we do all well to avoid the near occasion of sin. Um, page 124-125 of my edition. Again, there's lots of different editions. We are in Book 7. Book 7 of the Confessions. He writes, Accordingly, whatever things exist are good, and the evil into whose origins I was inquiring is not a substance. For if it were a substance, it would be good. Either it would be an incorruptible substance, a great good indeed, or a corruptible one, which could be corrupted only if it were good. And then he ends this whole paragraph, and I don't want to accuse Augustine of rambling, certainly not. His words, I, I, but really, I, I don't think so. I think that's like inappropriate. Like Dr. Burns, who gave an amazing talk, God bless him, what a great talk. Um, he was right. He's like, how sad is it that we'll never be able to read all of this man's incredible words? And we don't believe... His writings are inspired by the Holy Spirit in the way the Bible is, is the Word of God. But he certainly is very blessed by God uh, and has so much to say. So I don't want to accuse him of rambling. It's not that. He just goes on along about this kind of same point. And he concludes with, very importantly, right? For our God has made all things very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Yeah, talk to you about, Erica, what are, what's Augustine's view of the nature of evil? It's a huge point we talked about last class. By the way, I'm so glad that you're here, for real, because it's like, I love your insights. You were so helpful in the preparation of the course. Um, talk to me about that. Augustine and evil. What is the nature of evil? What should we, what, what do we have to know? Um, so, remind me, is City of God after this in your session? City of God's next, yeah. Okay, so you, you'll get a bit more of that in this in City of God, um, especially, I think, around book 12 of it. Um, but, Augustine, um, points out, I think more clearly there, but also in the Confessions, about how um, God's holding everything in existence, but everything has being um, through God, and um, sin and evil are falling away from that being, and they're falling away from that, and so even 
they, so they have no real existence or no true existence because um, insofar as they have being or insofar as anything is, um, it still is true God and the other God. And so um, because of that, um, like something which is a um, falling away from him or a, a privation of lack um, cannot have being of its own because it's defined um, in relation to God who is being and true departure from that being right yeah it's so well put exactly i'm gonna really try to tease this out myself in the next hippo lecture on the, the nature of evil the problem of evil and i absolutely love the way that he your explanation was perfect i think it well summed up his views and i think this is kind of lacking in our culture today i think anyways because people want to frame evil as a positive good and it falls in this kind of manichaean heretical blasphemous you know blessed be god forever but like separate gods right you know yin and yang dark and light no no no. it's not there's not like separate gods and they're competing there's only god who is the non-contingent being whose existence is his essence um who in the beginning it was only him and who's outside of time and space in eternity and everything that he made is good the obviously the most obvious example the greatest example is lucifer who was made a good angel his existence was good he was made for goodness he of his own free will, and oh, there you go, right? The tying in of free will to the problem of evil rebelled, and here we have our woe is us fallen world. But exactly as you said, evil of itself isn't a counterpart to God or a counterbalance. All God made is good. God is goodness itself. Evil is the lacking of that which should be there. He talks about the middle part of the book, on um, book uh, eight right now. Um, and now I had discovered the good pearl to bite. I had to sell all that I had, and I hesitated. The burden of the world weighed me down with a sweet drowsiness, such as commonly occurs during sleep. No one wants to be asleep all the time, and the same judgment of everyone judges it better to be awake, yet often a man defers shaking off sleep when his limbs are heavy with slumber. Yeah. So, right, Augustine's talking about, um, you know, late have I loved you, grant me chastity, just not yet. He knows the proper path. His mom, Monica, has been praying, St. Monica has been praying for him for 20 years. He has this wonderful example of St. Ambrose and a personal example of personal charity and incredible intellectual capacity. He knows in a teleological sense almost where he is headed, where he should go. And yet he's explaining his own once more concupiscent, like weighing down his inability to get, to get on with what he's supposed to be doing. I think that late have I loved you um, you know, beauty ever ancient, ever new, which I'll read that whole quote again, um, coming up in a second, one of his most famous ones, right? But it's, yeah, it's this kind of idea of like the deferring of, of getting on with it. This is the last time I'm going to do a shout out to like this morning. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we're doing this because really like a couple times, the coolest person ever, the, the legend of the whole Augustine experience outside of Father Chase, I got to say is Brad King. Barb, they're always here. Um, Brad, who's not here today, the last three of our classes, the, the, the main stream on Monday has always been pretty well attended. But on Friday, it's just been me and Brad. As today, it's just you and I kind of just discussing and talking, and which has been very fruitful and very fun. Again, I love Brad. It's just fun to talk to him. This is really good, I think, and helpful to review the previous week's stuff. I'm excited about this because whoever has watched that initial episode... Um, with this small brief thing that, again, I'm going to kind of like um, graft on to the next one, I think will be very, very helpful. We're going to, uh, when we're done, come May, your question about what's coming next. Yeah, next is, after we finish Confessions, it's five weeks on City of God, so a month and a half on City of God, basically. Come May, we're going to have everything, we'll have like 60 hours on St. Augustine. And you, you talked about not being an expert on certain parts. I'm not an expert on Augustine at all. I've said it a million times. My, my, Background is American Civil War history, 19th century, and really Renaissance onward. I'm not an August, Augustine scholar whatsoever. I think despite that, and God help us, we'll have like, again, a 60-hour podcast. And that's going to be super cool. So, so definitely not from an expert myself, but yet someone who is ever by the day becoming more and more of a lover of this man and his, all the genius he has to, to offer us. So, um, yeah, thank you for being here because I was planning on doing this it's like freestyle, but it's way better with a real person. Book nine. What do you think about this? You pierced my heart with the arrow of your love. And then Chadwick gives a footnote. He says, The symbol of Christ as heavenly arrows was familiar from the Latin version of Origen's commentary on the Song of Songs. Augustine's African critic, 
Arnobius the Younger could write of quote, quote, Christ our Cupid. Talked about that last class. What are your thoughts on Christ our Cupid? So I guess what what comes to mind here, and I think I think we this is something we'll see more of again again in um, City of God, especially towards the end. Um, but there in particular, um, Augustine talks about how um, Christ is um, the mediator between um, God and man through um, through the incarnation and through becoming. Human, um, he's he's like literally in himself uniting um, God and man, and I think through that incarnation, um, I guess he's drawing, I guess he's pointing out like that in that incarnation, there's some, I guess, I don't, I want to avoid the word comprehensibility because God's um, obviously not comprehensible, but um, to us at least, but um, there's some, there's some knowledge of God that we are able to have and an understanding that we could not have before that um, we have through Christ and then of course through um, through his death on the cross um, there is like literally lowering himself to the point of death and then he's bringing he's bringing us up and he's bringing human nature up with him and through that there's just this miraculous um, like act of love um, that uniting um, Uniting and redeeming um, man back to back to God or back to like union with God in a way that um, he was lacking since the fall and um, so I, I think that's what that's what I'd be inclined to say Augustine is alluding to. Yeah, it's very good. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I think that's very well said. Um, yeah, and there's like in in your answer, there's a lot of different levels and different tributaries and like taking off points and that's what I love so much about his work I think or that I begin to love my my knowledge of him prior to you and I meeting for the first time and talking and planning stuff and beginning this course was beyond below rudimentary like very very bare bones and I think okay I'm familiar with the different ideas in the confessions in the city of God especially and I've had read both of them before but never on the level of focus of having to teach it and talk about it. And there's so many different levels to his thinking. It's, it's incredibly fun, too. I think Dr. Burns is very much correct in his talk that it's just very exhilarating reading. It's very interesting reading. You're not simply just taking theological medicine for its necessity to swallow this bitter pill. You know, it's, like, it's actually very, very fun. Uh, into book 10, kind of almost, we're almost done, closing out the thing um, of the review. Again, the full the episode was all of them have been about an hour. I think only one was under an hour one was about an hour and a half so if you're watching this on the channel and online now you're watching it in the place where all these things are under the maple syrup history playlist tab but um the full discussion again of this was was on monday and stuff so i don't i while thrilled to retread this ground in a short cliff notes thing i also don't want to go over everything we talked about not just for the sake of time but because Anyone who faithfully watches the channel, and thank you for doing so, you've, you've already heard this. So just the main kind of final points, you never abandon what you have begun, make perfect my imperfections. This is when he's talking about do his confessions edify. And he says, yeah, and he's like, you know, God grant it. This is you know, one of the first like self-help books, right? Like God grant that people from my own spiritual journey and testimony, my overcoming of concupiscent, thorn of lust, all that, it'll give... Uh, help to people that need it. They'll see themselves in me and also turn to God. Augustine, we know, is so much about God's providence, God's will, God granting the grace. It is not us. There's a separation of Christianity from all religions in so many ways, but that it's not about us trying to perfect ourselves in this heretical Pelagian style, but it's God reaching down on the cross, right, and giving us the grace and calling us to him. God never gives up on Augustine. Talks about uh, tell me of my God who you are not. Tell me something about him. With a great voice they cried out, he made us, quoting Psalm 99. My question was the attention I gave to them and their response was their beauty. And he's, oh, he's talking about beauty a lot. I love this concept too. In um, all of the things that we're doing at Augustine's this year, Dr. Burns, um, my Hippo lectures, the class, we're always focused on this man. In the first Hippo lecture that I did, I used the medium of two models on a first date 
a guy and a girl who are, well, of course, from the profession, like incredibly physically beautiful. And I use that intentionally so. And in a certain sense, like the guy in the story, he starts having this concupiscent approach to it. He's so focused on the woman and her beauty and wanting to impress her that he's kind of getting away at one point from the theological lessons this priest, it's revealed later in the story that he's a priest, is trying to tell him. So it's using it on like a double-edged sword. Like it's, I think, you know, beauty is super important evangelically. Like, leads you to the ultimate beauty of God, but can also be a distraction, as our guy knew better than anyone else. Like, you can be distracted by the beautiful things of birth, whether it's other people, shiny metals, wealth, in the, the whole Roman idea of glory, right? Um, okay, so that's kind of what we have basically done. Eric, I'll give you the last word on whatever in a second, because, again, I'm not being nice or whatever. You know Augustine better than I do. It's true. It's just true, period. So I just love to hear any last things you have to say, um, I'll just read one more time. Yeah, last thing I'll just read from page 201 in the Chadwick edition, book 10. The whole quote, this is not the, the third time we've heard it in full, but it's so famous, right? Later, I loved you, beauty so old, so new. Later, I loved you, and you see you were within. I was in the external world and sought you there. And in my unlovely state, I plunged into those lovely creative things which you made. You were with me, and I was not with you. The lovely things kept me far from you, though, if they did not have their existence in you, they had no existence at all. You called and cried out loud and shattered my deafness. You were radiant and resplendent. You put flight to my blindness. You were fragrant. I drew in my breath and now pant after you. I tasted you and I feel but hunger and thirst for you. Touch me and I am set on fire to attain the peace which is yours. Um, very much, you know, Grammy Chastity, just not yet, and uh, Take and Read. I think it's one of the most famous quotes associated with him. Our hearts are restlessly resting in you, of which the Confessions opens, right? The, the, mo the most famous Augustine quote is right in the beginning of the book. Last thoughts. I guess with, with you just reading that quote, especially right after we talked about um, the um, Christ Christ Cupid quotation, it, it strikes me, um, once again, I guess how much of... Um, I guess the confessions very much transcends genres. There's so many different genres that um, that it falls into, but um, one of them seems to be a love story, and so there's this just um, like completion or building up of this like love story of um, Augustine, like coming back to and falling back in love um, with Christ. That I think we're seeing culminated here, um, and then he's again referring to um, I guess the things or the um, is that falls into temptation and into evil again how they they're um, apart from or tending away from God um, who is his very being um, and so you, you've got again in that quotation him um, alluding to them as privations or as um, departures away from being and then then there's this um, reference to um, created things and he's seeing them as He's seeing them as something that drew him away in um, an empty understanding of them, but um, through their beauty and order, he, he's particularly big on order. There's um, a beautiful discussion, of, especially of seasons and the ordering of the seasons and um, how created things through their very ordering in particular um, point back towards God. Um, I think here there's the, there's the change that um, through the progression of his life and through the progression of um, the confessions as we as we travel through parts of his life with him, um, he's he's now seeing those um, created things in their like true beauty and in, in their reflection of God as order and as creator of them. So I guess um, to sum that up, we're seeing we're seeing what what had led him astray, how he'd fallen away from the being of God referenced in that. We're seeing um, him him now. Um, experiencing um, experiencing the way the beauty and order of created things point back to God as the source of their very being and their order and we're um, we're witnessing in a beautiful way how he's fallen back in love with God and how, how the confessions is a love story of a kind cool that's that's fantastic that is like so philosophically dense what you just said in the, in the best way it's awesome and Let's end on that. I mean, like, well, welcome to this next episode. This is going to air before the traffic sound and the maple syrup bottle. But and then we'll just go into the thing that we have on Monday. But that's a fantastic way. And thank you, Erica. Brilliant. 
it's a love story of some sense. This love story, the ultimate lover, God, you know, calling us all to to that you know agape love with Him. So God bless you guys, and I, I would say like see you later, but it's just like we're just getting started. So welcome to the new episode. <laughs>
even if we live to 110 without having exhausted the vast corpus of Augustine's works. To be real, you probably could read all this stuff if you live to be 110. Let's be honest, right? If you live to 110, you probably, especially if you're like 40 right now, 70 years, you probably could read it all. <laughs> Dr. Burns, come on, man. He's right, though. Seriously, he's absolutely right that, you know, this wealth of knowledge, one of the greatest, if not the greatest church fathers. And so of the tertiary kind of triple level thing of my analysis, your points, I'm most interested in what Augustine says. So let's, let's get down to it right away. Page 221, book 11. Book 11 through 13 is the pertinent thing. Betsy, please do uh, email me if you can, that I can fix the syllabus to include the book numbers. Oh, okay. you, you, keep, you keep forgetting to email me. The error is mine. I keep forgetting just to do it. It's my bad. It's not your fault. It's, I, I need to remember. But if you're like, what are you talking about? The, the version of the book that you have, Loretta, for City of God is the exact same one I have. There's like 10 different versions. So if I list like, you know, read page 80 to 160, you and I are on the same page. Someone from someone else might be like 72 to 152. So I'll list the book numbers, Betsy, if you'll remind me. But again, the, this it is my fault. I'd like to you know note to myself. Book 11. Lord, eternity is yours, so you cannot be ignorant of what I tell you. Your vision of occurrences in time is not temporally conditioned. Why then do I set before you an ordered account of so many things? It is certainly not through me that you know them. Okay, two really cool things. Augustine goes nuts in the next like 40 pages. This is just point one, right? Point one again. Your vision of occurrences in time is not temporally conditioned. God is outside of time. Augustine goes nuts in the next like 40 or 50 pages. Just what is time? What is time? What does that mean? I myself as well am fascinated by this concept. I've thought about this many, many times in my own work, the precipice of time. And I hope the following thing that I tell you will give you goosebumps and be creepy in a very cool way. Think about the fact that all of us simply live on that ever receding precipice of time. The present right now, Monday, September 23rd, AD 2024, 1 35 p.m. That's present time now, right? But as soon as that clock turns to 1 36, that is as inaccessible as Alexander the Great. It is gone. It's lost to the sands of time, even though it was just one minute ago. And the minute you stop to think about, I'm in the present, it's already gone, right? I love Augustine so much for a million reasons. I love his reflections on time. He talks often about eternity is not endless time. And I will confess to having made that mistake myself too. Okay, so it's 136. What, what I was just saying about present time is as close to us as George Washington, as Cyrus the Great, as the Big Bang, right? It's gone. I can't go back. To, I can never go back to 135 p.m., September 24th, AD 2024. It's gone forever, right? Isn't that crazy? Like, it's always receding. I used to make that mistake often, too, that like, hey, so heaven is just an endless time. It's like, you know, a billion years plus more billion plus quadrillion, right? That kind of thing. Or God forbid, that beautiful Fatima prayer, save us from the fires of hell, the souls to heaven. That if someone were to go to hell, they're just like a billion years forever in, in torment. It's not so much that it's endless time, it's the absence of time. If all, if, if all of us in this room could, would never leave the room again and reality was stuck at 1.35 p.m. on September 23rd, the Twilight Zone, the old good ones with Rod Serling, did a really good job of this. Some guys like Messi, he, he, he discovers his watch, he can freeze time, he breaks it, and he's stuck forever, and now he's screwed kind of thing. And he deserved it because he messed with time, you know? He had his comeuppance. If we could stop time, that is what eternity is like. It is not just so many billion years. It's a frozen moment, not receding in the past. Augustine and later on Boethius, his great work is the consolation of philosophy. They talk about God. And if you learn one thing today, this is the only thing, this is good. They talk about God as the eternal now. God does not have past, present, and future. He was, is, and will be. He sees at the exact moment he is all-knowing. Everything is one moment to him. How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. Your ways are not our ways, Lord. Your ways are as far from the, you know, us as the east from the west, the Bible says. Go ahead. So in heaven, we will experience that eternal now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. Exactly. And that, where does that start? 
does that start the instant we die once we right. traverse through purgatory? Exactly. Amen. Just brilliant question. Seriously. Or what is the change in that at the time of the resurrection of the body? Right. So, <laughs> no, no, no. Time out. Time out. It's so it's funny you're laughing because we we live in this kind of anti intellectual culture. You've said so many times, right? Or any kind of deep questions prompt laughter. So these are brilliant, awesome questions. Um, my short answer would be before I try to answer it in some way, and may God help us and the Holy Spirit enlighten all of us always, our feeble minds and feeble understanding. Um, my number one answer would be not a cop out, but I love what St. Paul says eye is not seen, ear is not heard. I love that about heaven. That we just, it's none of our business in a service. We cannot even begin to comprehend it right now. We're not God. We're these humble speck creatures but god loves us and died for us but the grandeur the glory of what awaits us is incomprehensibly good we can't even begin to even like uh, do an analogy to it so i have no idea trying to play with this question think about it i would say well at the moment of death right you have your particular judgment and then the general judgment is at the end of time when all of humanity is judged together the you know elect and the reprobate reprobate um i would say i'd imagine yeah like Catholic doctrine, right? The immortality of the soul. And when I say that you are your soul, no, right? We are not just angels. We are angels and animals. We are a soul and body composite. But the idea, right? You die, your body goes to corruption. What awaits man is worms, right? As the Psalms, the Book of Wisdom, Sirach, all these books talk about, right? How can you be pride of what awaits you is, is dirt, right? You are dust, to dust you shall return. Your body goes to dust, but you don't lose a moment of consciousness. You are your soul. So you're there now disembodied as a soul, I guess, in this moment of eternal fixed state. The exception being, I guess, you're right. Purgatory is some kind of progressive thing. Um, Our Lady of Fatima says to the seers, you know, the, this woman will be in purgatory to the end of time. So time it seems to imply it's still going there. We hear about doing indulgences in the proper way, not the way, not the way that Luther criticized with the clinking of the coins, like buying heaven and simony and the stuff that he, he was right to criticize. Um, trying to buy them, excuse me, you cannot, right? The, the, the false way of trying to do that. The proper indulgence is of like, you know, you get a plenary indulgence for doing, I believe, like the Stations of the Cross on Friday in Lent, you get a plenary indulgence, forgiveness of all punishment of sin, due to sin. So I'd say maybe after death in purgatory, keyword maybe, I don't know. And, and I, with these kind of theological questions, not only am I not a theologian, they are so serious and I never want to misspeak. Anyone who watches our program knows I have an endless, endless appetite for the stupidest, most absurd humor. The exception is when it's like really serious stuff like this. Well, it'll always be very serious. I don't know exactly from a theological perspective. My guess would be in purgatory, sure, it's a fixed state. That's why we're supposed to, hey, you know, reminder, pray for the souls in purgatory. They can't help themselves. The time for repentance and amending your life is now while on earth, while in this cycle of past, present, and future. So purgatory is some kind of fixed state, but there also is a a change because everyone in purgatory is saved obviously and eventually will go to heaven dante i read the divine comedy last summer and then read it again and it's become like maybe, maybe my favorite book of all time discounting the bible which doesn't count because it's the word of god but just like normal books not non-divine books divine comedy is maybe the best ever in dante there's a lot of time and movement the guys are doing different kind of punishments they're experiencing time they're ascending the mountain especially dante and virgil when they come out of hell they climb this mountain in purgatory towards where Beatrice is waiting for Dante and all that. So, yeah, it's funny that you're laughing. That's our culture, right? Whenever someone asks a very deep question, those are deep questions. It's like, oh, it's so funny because we've become so, like, little, you know, that, shut up, put the game back on, you know, that kind of stuff. Where it's like, that's the right question. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but what Augustine is saying, putting the focus off of us for a second, um, yes, we will get to 100%, I would say 100%, I would, you know, plant my flag on that right in heaven beholding the beatific vision we now participate in that timelessness of course that fixed state of eternal glory as god forbid the fixed state of eternal uh dishonor in hell right um he's talking about just god though right god is outside of time and space god is truly not bound by time and two cool reflections on this i told you um father karapi one of my favorite preachers of all time uh, a woman was despairing. I've told this story in this class before because her son jumped off a bridge and she was like, well, I'm a faithful Catholic. I know how serious of a sin that is. And he told her, he's like, and he wasn't just trying to comfort a grieving mother. He was being theologically correct. He's like, God is outside of time and space. Pray for your son every day the rest of your life for the salvation of the soul. God can apply that at the moment of his death. 
Who knows? That's not your business. You know, God is outside of time and space. Just because you're praying after the fact doesn't mean that God can't predestine in a predestined way, you know, whatever, right? I love that. A final note too, like note to atheists. I may have made this point before, but it's like atheists will make the point and their critique seems kind of good on the face of it. Look, you guys are saying God is all powerful and all knowing, right? Listen to what Augustine says here. Lord, eternity is yours. You cannot be ignorant of what I tell you. Like you know everything before I say it, right? Does not does not Christ in the gospel say, you know, your father knows what you need before you ask him? Okay. So the atheists are like, why do you guys pray? That sounds sounds dumb. If you guys actually had faith, you would do nothing. God knows what you need, just give it to you. Well, because God told us to. I was listening to a beautiful uh, you know, sermon yesterday, and it was like, because God wants us to. Of course, God knows we want, and God can just grant it. God wants us to do our part. Because free will is real. We have a choice to say no or yes to God. And that also goes into this timelessness with God and Augustine's uh, argument on, on, on predestination. God doesn't, you know, foreordain people to hell. That would make him evil. Blessed be God forever. God is all good. Augustine, before the first nine books, talking about how God is all good, hence why evil is a lack. Evil does not have a positive nature. Evil just is the absence of something good. God didn't make hell, God didn't make evil, God didn't make sin, but he did give us free will. Going back to Dante, over the gates of hell, love built me, is written. God loves you so much, if you don't want to be him, be with him, you can go to hell, literally, right? You cannot be with him for eternity. God forbid. C.S. Lewis, the door to hell is closed from within. You can make that choice. So with God's timeless nature, God's all-knowing nature, all that is true, but yet he still wants us to ask him for stuff. And this priest who was doing this homily, it's, I was watching this online, and it's, I'm not, I don't like that when people like, they're talking about, you know, Bishop Barron, right? Or someone, or Father Mike Schmitz, and they're like, well, this one priest, I don't want to mention his name. Just mention his name. Like, I, I don't know who this priest's name was. So I'm not like being coy. I don't know who this priest was. It was someone online. His name wasn't listed. But in the homily, he was saying like, it was a very funny point. It made me laugh out loud. God is the only person being who is complimented by you asking him for stuff. You know, like, if I just go up to Betsy, Betsy, I need a new car. Betsy, give me a Maserati. Betsy, give me things. Betsy's probably not going to be happy to see me. She's probably like, this guy's the worst. You know, and Betsy, I need you to give me this. God wants us to petition him for stuff. He wants us to, you know, ask him for our daily bread. And, of course, that beautiful prayer form, acts, adoration, contrition. We're supposed to adore him above all, first and last. Ask forgiveness. Thank him for what we have. But supplication is part of that, too. So, Augustine, so awesome on time. All of us live on the precipice of time, and God is outside of it. Point number two, um, they are all things added to us as we seek your kingdom and your righteousness. He talks about gold, silver, precious stones, fine clothes. Augustine is not saying they're bad. The root of all evil isn't money. It's the love of money, right? Augustine, there's some kind of pair. My favorite Augustine quote is not grant me chastity, Lord, just not yet. It's not. Our hearts are restless, they rest in you. My favorite Augustine quote is a paraphrase thing like, love God above all and then do whatever you feel like doing. Love God and do whatever you want. He's like, you can have nine Maseratis, gold, silver, whatever, but you have to follow Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God, all else will be added unto you. Because then most likely, if you're, if you're being filled with God's grace and you are seeking him first, what are you going to use all that stuff for? Most likely you'll probably sell your Maseratis and like help the homeless and blah, 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 and whatever, right? You'll probably be a good person. Mother Teresa, I always quote her in some way, and I'm, I'm also heavily paraphrasing, but said something, I think, or if not, you know how these famous things go, right? This famous person said this, turns out they didn't say it at all. Maybe she never said it. Maybe I just heard some person say that Mother Teresa said it, but it sounds like something she would say that, you know, she wished the best people in the world were the billionaires because they had, would have the money to affect change. Wouldn't it be cool if a billionaire completely funded all of this missionaries of charity in India? That'd be awesome, right? And, and, and what, if, what if a billionaire like funded a thousand Eucharistic retreats? That'd be great, right? So we want people, money's not bad. It's the love of money. God forbid the worship of money, the idolatry of anything that's wrong. And Augustine is very much, if anyone's not a fan of the book of wisdom or hasn't read it enough, I, I highly recommend it. These two deuterocanonical books that we sadly do not share with our Protestant brethren is not part of their Old Testament, but it's part of ours. We believe indeed they're inspired works. Wisdom is 19 chapters. The book of Sirach is 51. The 70 chapters in the Deuteronomy Chronicles are so good. Um, chapter 9 of the book of Wisdom is a prayer that Solomon does, just like asking for wisdom. 
And Augustine talks about this. In him are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And for those treasures I search in your books, Moses wrote of him. He said, he himself said this. This is the declaration of truth. Like to seek wisdom, and it says in the book of wisdom throughout the Bible, is more precious than even the thing higher in this chapter. Love God above all, everything will be added unto you, including precious stones and whatever. But what you should really be hoping for above all is wisdom, right? That, that, that wisdom is the ultimate kind of gift you could receive. Um, and I, I could not agree more. I don't think anyone here would say, I, I don't want wisdom. If there's, there's probably some kind of Aesop's stable parable where it's like, you know, anyone know the joke about asking a genie for one wish? What can you not ask for? Genie rubs the bottle and he's like, you can have whatever you want, only one wish. What can you not ask for? But it's a very wise response. I want unlimited wishes. Hey, man, you said one wish. I wish for unlimited wishes. That's kind of what wisdom is. Wisdom is unlimited wishes. If you have wisdom, you're probably going to be good at business, know how to have a good diet, know how to work out properly, know how to manage your money, know how to be kind to others, know when to shut your mouth. Like, all right, all you'll probably be good at everything if you're wise, right? But if you're stupid, you know, then it's bad. That's the lesson of maple syrup history. Don't be stupid. Trademark. I'm going to get that patent. Um, point number four on page 225, he talks about creation by the eternal word. Indeed, right? Eternal word television network named after Jesus Christ, EWTN. Such a famous enterprise. You forget. I mean, so beautifully named after the eternal word. Second person, Holy Trinity, by which God the Father, you know, created all things in the beginning, right? Speaking of, cool connection back to oligarchs. Does anyone know about the Mother Angelica yacht oligarch story? This is what I mean about, I think I've told this before in this class at some point. This is what I mean about rich people having money. Mother Angelica was trying to get her operation off the ground. And I think people can overdo the thing like this sassy old lady had no filter. It's kind of, kind of obnoxious, but she was actually like that in a very cool way. Like she told a bishop once, like he can go put his head in the toilet and flush. It was so funny. Like, and it was perfectly good because Mother Angelica had the gravitas to say that. Right. And she's this New York girl, this Italian New York girl is awesome. All that stuff is great. Mother Angelica, zero filter. Um, she goes to God in prayer before the Eucharist. She's like, you know, Lord, we need money to, to fund this operation like that. Right. Does a bunch of prayer, a grand woman of faith. Hopefully one day, you know, St. Angelica pray for us. Hopefully one day, an amazing woman. So one of her assistants, like mother, mother, come here. Someone's on the phone for you. And there's this dude on the, on the yacht. And he's like, I want to give you basically like $30 million. I don't know why, but like, I felt this inspiration. I need to give you money. And I think he's looking for like, to get his back padded, right? Oh man, thank you so much, right? She just goes, wire it. Click. Right? <laughs> it's like, which is even better. That's so great because that shows him. I'm not going to hear, kiss your butt, you know? Like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's like, look, if we're all about the work of God, sincerely, thank you. And I bet she prayed for that guy and his family every single day forever, right? But that guy got a, a nuclear weapon of prayers. So he got, you know, a sevenfold than, than what he maybe wanted. Like he's getting his ego massage. Like, thank you. You're so amazing. Like, okay, there's a great example. And God bless that guy, that anonymous donor, whoever that guy was. What a saint himself. That guy used money to spread the word of God. He, that was perfect use of money. Thank God. I'm so glad he was some kind of rich CEO kind of guy. With I hope he had nine votes. You know, like that's 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 awesome. Um, once more on wisdom, guys. Uh, page two twenty seven, book um, eleven. Now we're still on book eleven. <laughs> we never left book eleven. I saw the XI for whatever reason. I thought it was IX. I thought we were at book nine. Wow, I'm an, I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> on page two twenty seven, still book eleven. Quote: Wisdom, wisdom, it is which so shines right through me, cutting a path. Through the cloudiness which returns to cover me as I fall away under the darkness and the load of my punishments. Wisdom, wisdom, it is which shines right through me, cutting a path to the cloudiness. Like wisdom is that beacon of light. And we so I always, I love that prayer. Please come, Holy Spirit, the hearts of your faithful and kindle them in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, they shall be created. You shall renew the face of the earth, O God, who has instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant through the same Holy Spirit may seek right judgment in all things and evermore joy his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. I love that prayer, like that wisdom beseeching prayer of God, the Holy Spirit. 
We associate wisdom with the Holy Spirit, of course, and in the divine wisdom of Christ. Hagia Sophia, that grand cathedral named for the holy wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, the word of God. And um, as all things are consubstantial in that triune unity, three persons, one God, of course, wisdom pertains to all parts of the Godhead. Um, still on this idea of time, a law, large part of our third discussion today, books 11 through 13 are on God's timelessness. Quote, uh, this is my reply to anyone who asks, what was God doing before he made heaven and earth? My reply is not that which someone is said to have given as a joke to evade the force of the question. He said he was preparing hells for people who inquire into profundities. It is one thing to laugh, another to see the point at issue, and this reply I reject. I would have preferred him to answer, quote, I am ignorant of what I do not know. And we were kind of having this conversation before, I don't know. Rather than reply so as to ridicule someone who has asked a deep question to win approval for an answer, which is a mistake. No, I say that you, our God, are the creator of every created being, and assuming that by heaven and earth has been every created thing, I boldly declare, before God made heaven and earth, he was not making anything. If he was making anything, it could only be something created. Um, Aquinas will pick up a lot on this as well. God is the only non-contingent being. God is the only being whose essence is his existence. God, as the Catechism says, is the Supreme Spirit who subsists in, a, in and of himself. My favorite uh, Aquinas quote, I love it, it's so perfect. We think Aquinas is so proper or whatever, right? It's such like a frat boy question. Aquinas in class once raises his hands and he says, what is God? Not who is God. It's like, what are you talking about? What? What is God? Right. And that's actually the most, uh, it strikes kind of like disrespectful at first. It's the most respectful question. It's like, no, tell me like the full measure. What are you even, what are you even saying? What is this grand, perfect being where, that is God? And Augustine is spending a long time talking about explaining that he is the supreme being who exists in and of himself, who the atheist will falsely ask, well, if, you know, if God created the world. Who created God? And of course, it shows how bad they are at philosophy in that moment. That's the whole point. That thing, that being, long before, praise God, we understand Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Word is made flesh and dwelt among us, who God is personally, just the idea of like a supreme being, that one being that has no beginning and, and created himself and is creation, has always existed outside time and space. All men call that God. All men, even the most strict atheists would agree, right? So if there's this force that's outside in the universe and has always been there, I guess that's God. That I, I, I would agree that that's called God. All men agree. So God is a supreme, self-subsistent being outside of time and space, and he's here again, so apropos to our conversation before, saying we shouldn't laugh off these questions about like, you know, eternal destiny and the beginning of time and you know, pre-Big Bang. It's like, these are the questions we should be asking. This, like, this class is so fun, and it's um, in studying people like St. Augustine that we can dive into these profound questions more. So continuing on, page 230, I'll, I'll, I'll stop saying obvious things. Forgive me for being repetitious all the day long today. I'm sorry. I'm, every page number that I'm reading from is the same, obviously. I'm not, I'm not switching books, right? That would be a funny comedy, though. I have a different book every time, <laughs> different version. It's the same Chadwick version. Um, by the way, guys, Chadwick is a sick name. In frat boy talk, to be a Chad can have a negative connotation. It's almost like a cat is a bad guy. But it also can mean like that guy's a legend, like he's an alpha like leader. Like if your name is Chadwick, you already are Chad. Like if like having your name, if like your name being like Super Mike, like Super is already in your name. Like Chad is already in Chadwick. It's an amazing name. Henry the Chad Chadwick. Um, <laughs> Two thirty. It is not in time that you precede times; otherwise, you would not precede all times. In the sublimity of an eternity, which is always in the present, you are before all things past and transcend all things future. Remember, we said. Precipice of time for us, not for God. Let me re repeat that again from Augustine. In the sublimity of an eternity, which is always in the present, you are before all things past and transcend all things future, because they are still to come. And when they have come, they are past. But you are the same, and your years do not fail. Your years neither come nor go. Your years are one day. All of everything is now for God. Hence why he can predestine people to heaven and hell based on their free actions. 
the Protestants either misunderstand. And by the way, whenever I go off on these rants, like I want everyone to be Catholic 100%. Do not lose your train of thought. I'll be upset if you do. Um, I want everyone to be Catholic, of course. I have deep respect for sincere people of all faiths. Like all oh, these Protestants, like I'm so like, I'm so smart. Like I'm, I'm an idiot, right? So I'm not trying to sit here and like criticize these people. I'm just saying like, I think they really misunderstand that. The Protestants who try to like highlight God's sovereignty and then say, well, yeah, God actually made these people be born to go to hell. And it's like, no, he didn't, right? God did not make evil. Evil does not have a positive nature. God allows there to be hell because he actually loves us. Because it would be wrong for a man to force a woman to marry him, even if it would be better for her. Imagine the woman's like, I want to be a prostitute and sleep under a bridge and do drugs. That's bad. And the guy's like the Richard Gere movie. Like, I'm going to, you know, Pretty Lady, whatever. The Pretty Lady or My Fair Lady, what's the name of the movie? Where Richard Gere, the pretty woman, pretty woman. Um, yeah, pretty woman. So in that movie, like, it's good that she ends up with the Richard Gere rich guy. It's probably better for a woman to be married to a wealthy guy than be a prostitute under a bridge. But God loves us so much. He's like, you can do that. If you want to be a prostitute under a bridge, like, I'm not going to force you. God will not force you. He won't violate our free will. Can God make himself limited? Yeah, he chose to make himself. He doesn't violate our free will. So um, I think the Protestants misunderstand about predestination. It's like God predestined us to heaven or hell knowing that we're going to choose to be prostitutes under the bridge or we're going to say, I'll get cleaned up and go to rehab and join you. Like he knows how what we're going to choose. He doesn't, he doesn't make people to live under a bridge. And the person on the bridge saying, well, I actually would like to live in a house. No, you're made for the bridge. No, that's that God is not, God has no evil. He's all good. And he is so good, in fact, he allows hell to be a possibility because he won't force us to be with him. It would be wrong even if that woman didn't know what was good for her, for the man to force her to marry him. That would be wrong, right? Uh, so it was about the time. Go for it. Any questions are great, really. Go for it. Yeah, and when you like read Genesis, uh, God created the earth in one day and like, like rested on the seventh day. I, I would like you guys to mind to read the book. I think later, honestly, that's going to help. It talks a little bit about that part of it as well. So. Are you asking about like, is Genesis a literal count in terms of days, or God being outside of it? What do you mean? What was yeah, the the interpretation? Exactly. Yeah. So with with like I I will say I hate and Brad same thing to you. Do not lose your train of thought. I'm coming to you next. Your question next. I hate the kind of postmodern heretic people who are like, well, everything in the Bible is like. And now I believe the Bible is the word of God. All of it is true. But Bishop Barron, credit to him, when he was Father Barron talked about the Bible as like a library and some things are poetry and some things are like mathematics. There's different genres. From what I understand, the church allows you to have like a, an allegorical reading of Genesis. A day can mean an epic to be like hundreds of thousands of years, not a literal day. I don't know many Catholics who are like young earth creationists think the world's actually 6,000 years. I certainly don't. I am very much with the popes and the kind of a lot of people in the church who are like, there is no conflict between faith and science. There's not. Uh, the first Vatican Council in 1870, a great document, said there can never be a conflict between truths. If the world is 13.4 billion years old, and like the scientists say, because the, the carbon dating and studying cosmology in the Big Bang, and God also is Lord, and he's real, well, then obviously God made it that way, because all truth is truth. Obviously, God decided. I don't even know what I think about evolution, like in terms of like the particulars. Of course, things evolve. Of course, there's adaptation. I don't know, like, the exact process and there's so much stuff there's the scientism like darwinism that's like everything darwin said is correct there are scientists who think darwinism has failed there's a lot of kind of missing holes i don't even know what i think about that i simply think this these two things i think are true that christ is lord the bible is true and science is real and all that belong all truth is one thing so a genesis no i think my thing would be it's not a literal account it's not one day it's, it's using allegorical poetic language right to talk about a certain procedural thing between those seven days could be millions of years. Again, I don't know. I'm not a theologian, but I'm way more um, I'm way more uh, partial to that allegorical thing. The reason why go for it. Either one, exactly. Right. And exactly, and I'm not I'm not saying this like backtrack now. If someone says to me they think the world is six thousand years, I'm not like, oh, what an idiot. Like, great, okay. Um, in the whole Galileo, like, like I, I agree with you. Like, yeah, like this is not. Ultimately, it's not conducive to our salvation either way. Like, right? I mean, like ultimately, we have to love God, love neighbor. 
I don't think that it really matters. Um, but I think my question is more about like you're just saying that God is doing one thing after doing another, mm -hmm. but that's not like true. Like the but God is not what do you mean? So you're asking God would be doing one thing after another when he is yeah. outside his time. And like, oh, oh, I'm like resting on the. Got it. Uh, but so to us, it is, um, see, because we are in time, it seems like subsequential actions, but to God, it is one act. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and, and uh, another thing, like, agree with that, the different. Perceptions like we can't think as God, right? You know, He is so far above us, we can't see it through God's eyes in that way, right? Like God condescends to lower Himself to our level. That's the whole beauty of the incarnation that the eternal Word made Himself a helpless baby, right? He came down to us because we can't reach up to Him. But no, I, I would say it still makes perfect sense. God acts in time. Just because you're outside of time doesn't mean you can't enter it. So imagine if, like, this is a bad example, it's not perfect, but imagine like all of the universe is this table right here, this music stand. I am outside of all, you'll agree, right? I'm above all of it. But every once in a while, I can do this. I can like tap on parts of it. I can enter it and join it while also being outside of it. When I tap on it, I'm not no longer, I'm still outside, I'm still above it. I still own this whole thing. And yeah, with, with God, it's so much infinitely more than that. But him being outside of time and space doesn't mean that he can't pierce through that veil as he does when he wants. But you're still in time, so every once in a while you're tapping on it, and that's... Whereas God is always tapping on it. Yeah, and, and Augustine, exactly. And Augustine says, later, I hope I get to this quote, and Brad, really, I'm coming to you next. Uh, thank you for your patience. Augustine at one point says, it's a brilliant, mind-breaking thing. He's like, you, O oh Lord, are ever at work and ever at rest. That's the ultimate mind-blowing paragraph. God is perfectly at rest. He's perfectly arrived. He cannot change because to change, as Augustine says, is a defect, right? It's a lack of perfection. Um, imagine like any of you, and you felt like, I look the best I've ever looked today. This is my best outfit. I had the best run, my best diet, whatever. And you'd want to have that forever. Like I want every day to be like this. This is the most perfect day, whatever. God is always at that perfect rest point of of arrival. He, he is perfect perfection, immutable, unchanging perfection. And yet he's ever at work. He's always tapping on the table in a way that I can never do in this analogy that admittedly is very weak. Because I just I, I actually I'm not transcendent. He is both transcendent and imminent at the same time. And that's why I made the argument one of the earlier points is so wonderful about the incarnation is in the point number thousand for the uniqueness of Christianity that a lot of religions have like, well, there's small, small local understanding of this local shrine, but it's like that has no universal power. It's just it's a local backwater thing. Who cares? Or people have always had an idea of like the sky being this all powerful God, but he doesn't care about you. So grand Christianity is the only thing. It's the all powerful God outside of heaven space who also has a personal relationship, small baby whose body, blood, soul, and divinity you consume in mass. Like the smallest and the grandest at the same time. God ever at rest, ever at work. And that, that sort of just the, the definition of it outside of the unmoved mover um, fits that so much. Um, from our point of view, we, we don't exist unless God is keeping us in existence at every moment. Right. You hold exactly. There's that old kind of Cistercian monk practice of just like taking deep breaths, sitting in a chair, aware of the fact God makes every one of my breaths come and go, every inhale, the complete dependence upon God. And so that should, if anyone struggles with anxiety and worry, be the ultimate dispelling agent. It's like, why are you worried about World War III or a meteor hitting the earth or whatever stuff? Every breath you take is dependent upon God. As the Bible says, not a hair, you know. I'd rather not see World War III that. Of course, but not not a you know not not a you know single what is it, like a sparrow falls from the sky or hair hair on your head without the father knowing and like God takes care of the smallest possible details. And um, indeed, no, you're right because we live as human beings in a fallen world. We do worry about these things and we have our anxieties. And yeah, get, imagine like you know, imagine now, God forbid, um, breaking news. You know, World War Three is commencing somehow. Something obvious. Good luck. To, hey, don't worry about it, guys. It's all good. God's got a plan. That I think even as believers, we believe that's true. We would still be very worried. We're people. We live in real time and space. So I agree with you. 
And yet we're supposed to have, we're supposed to aim for that kind of timeless attachment. Brad, you've been far too patient. Go, what question did you want to ask? Just make one real quick comment. Always talk about time. I'm wondering if Einstein isn't starting to swirl around in your grave a little bit. <laughs> Why, explain. Well, with his relativity theory, the speed of light, and time stuff. I'm not an expert on Einstein, I've studied it. I bet you know 10 times more than I do. Not necessarily conflict. It doesn't. But it go on. It makes me nervous anyway, just thinking about the future. But anyway, <laughs> you were talking about God knowing what someone would choose. Okay, so he knows the future. Is that what you're saying? Of course. Because the future is present all the time. Is present. Everything is present to him simultaneously. Okay. If if you're praying to God that some particular individual is going to win the election, um, <laughs> he knows what's going to happen, and he says, "Yeah, you got a good idea. What you going to?" Well, he's so, already so so you know so. I, your prayers exactly. So that's so you, no no exactly no. This is this is an amazing question. I know exactly what you're saying, and I think I have the answer in, in conjunction with what, what I think Betsy was just going to say. Exactly. God, we cannot fathom God's intelligence. It's not, number one, the best. It is on a scale beyond a scale, even saying on a scale. So can God be influenced by his people? Yeah. Look in the Old Testament, right? Isn't it like Moses? Like, what if there's 40 just people? What if there's 30 what if there's 20 people? Will you spare the city, remember? And then it's like not even five are found. Maybe he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. I forget exactly. Then the city's destroyed because there's no just people there. Or it's just like Lot is the one just guy. His wife is turned to a pillar of salt, right? When she looks back. You're praying for a certain result of the election. You're praying for a certain path for our country. God in his providence has applied all the prayers he knows you will do today, tomorrow, next week, whatever, in one instantaneous present. But your free will is not compromised. It's crazy to think about. You think, well, if God already knows, you decided it seems kind of fixed. It's only fixed to God who sees outside time and space. We work in, in real action. Does that make sense? So it's like using that, 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 that woman, uh, that example, the woman, her son jumped off the bridge. From all time and eternity, God knew, sadly, that man would use his free will to jump off the bridge but that his mom would pray for 42 years and four months for him and that he would be saved and she'd be a great saint because of that all at one time. But as they experienced it in real life, he jumped off the bridge. She despaired for him. She had to do it. So we experience it not outside of time and space. God experiences all at once. And that's the kind of meaning of predestination is God knows how much you will pray or won't pray. You'll be faithful or not. The, 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 the ultimate meaning, again, of predestination is that God assigns us to heaven and hell knowing in one instinct because everything is present what we we will do like think about a famous deathbed conversion of whoever i don't even have someone on my mind just imagine someone so you could say well god god just from all eternity predestined that guy who's a real terrible person like he was like a you know awful genocidal war leader predestined him to heaven it isn't that guy lucky well, he is lucky, thank God, because all of it's God's grace. God knew from all eternity, after doing all that stuff, the last moment he would repent. He knew that he would choose that. God didn't force him to whatever. He knew that God, Christ says, you know, my, my grace is sufficient for you. He knew that guy would respond to it. So does that make sense? So so, so like with, with the election, um, whoever wins or doesn't win or what happens to America, God knows how all that plays out because he knows everything. But he takes all of our actions in that into consideration the whole time along the way. Our actions and all our requests, maybe? Everything, of course. Absolutely, right? And sometimes he says no to our prayers, right? Like in that beautiful prayer, um, what uh, father would hand his son a scorpion when he asked for a loaf of bread, a stone when he asked for fish? Maybe what you're asking for is wrong. Not you personally, you, the general person. Like, I asked God, and I'm, you know, I, I, I did not. This is a stupid example. But like, you know, I wanted, I, I prayed to, you know, win $10 million and run Las Vegas. Maybe that's a bad intention. And God said, no, because it's a scorpion. Like this is, I'm not going to give you something that's bad for you. Which is another answer to atheists who are like, well, see, you know, if you just ask the Father in Jesus' name, you'll get whatever you want. No, like if it's compatible with God's will, it's good for you. 
Not, not if you ask for bad stuff. But I don't get to ask, you know, well, I hope this country falls into the ocean, like, right? So it's like God takes everything into consideration and in his providential majesty and outside of time control of all things makes it all work. And as Romans, I think, 8, what, 31 says, you know, it all, if God is for us, who can be against us and all things work for the good of those who love God. So if you're just loving God, doing your part, you can be sure that providential thing will will work out. Loretta, I totally stepped into your word. You're going to say something. Go. No, no, no. It's just wild thoughts going through my head. Tell me. Go. Go for it. Yeah, we, we pray for a good outcome. But maybe God knows that our country needs to be chastised. Right. We have to go through right. a Stalin or a Hitler or whatever to right. get back to him. Right. Those are the thoughts I have. That's exact. That's it. That is exactly correct. That was so brilliantly put. Whether that's true or not, who knows? But the potential of that, exactly. There you go. So all these Christians get together and they pray that, you know, candidate X gets elected, but candidate Y does. And, you know, has God abandoned us? Maybe that's the medicine for people that God actually wants this candidate that seems to be not that great. You know, and I, I, I love that we're talking in generalities. I'll never share my political views. Actually, I will, guys. I happen to be, I happen to be um, Brown Party. You've heard of Green Party? You've heard of Green Party, which is like environmentalist? I'm about dirt. All I care about is dirt. I'm Brown Party. Man of the soil. I'm a man of the soil, exactly. All I care about is make everything soil. <laughs> That's my one platform. Make everything. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. No, be serious for a second. Um, here's my proof how much I, I cannot. I'm so addicted. Soil, soil, yeah. I'm so addicted to absurd you know, comments. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I'm glad we're talking generalities. Whoever you are thinking about in the presidential election and vice versa, you know, filling your own whatever favorite candidate people you do or don't like, you're right. Just because people get behind and say, I want candidate whoever to get elected, maybe God's like, no, no, actually, this is the better, this is the bitter medicine you need. And I, I know Catholics who um, <laughs> the upcoming president, the presidential election think that the, the other person is the wrong one, you know, kind of stuff. I, re I read it, I try every day to read two or three. Um, Catholic periodicals. Here I'm being the hypocrite that I said I wouldn't be. I said earlier that if I, you know, if you're talking about Bishop Barron, just say Bishop Barron. Here I'm not going to tell you what the magazines are. It's just some magazines. But I try to read like you know two very conservative Catholic uh, articles and two very um, liberal ones, and they say very different things about Trump and Kamala. Very different, you know. And each one is the other person's the the end of times evil, whatever. Right. So it's like exactly how whoever you want to win the election, however you're praying and whatever kind of outcome. Loretta, your point is just beyond brilliant. Sincerely, it's like, that's right. Just because you, maybe actually God hears your prayers. And so for the outcome that is ultimately proper, we must pass through a time of chastisement or whatever. Yeah. And that is not a comfortable thought. Like you said, that's your, that's your point about, yeah, but I'd still be worth it World War III. And indeed, right. Augustine on page 239. Thanks, bro. Thanks for nothing, Augustine. Augie unit. He goes, I confess to you, Lord. I still don't know what time is. Thanks for nothing, man. After wearing out the mat of our minds for like 50 pages in these latter books, the end of the book, we're still on page on book 11. He just talks about, you know, but what method can that be measured? <laughs> Nevertheless, we do measure periods of time. I don't know. And then he's like, time is distension. It's just kind of like bloating apart. Past, present, future, which we experience the ever receding present into the past that is unaccessible, but God is outside of time and space. If the earlier parts of the book are so much about Augustine's own personal story, the earlier parts of confession are so much my own spiritual testimony. Our hearts are restless, they rest in you. My mom, St. Monica, who prayed all these years for me, my friend, Olympias, who was into all this gladiator stuff, and that was bad, and his ever, ever, ever constant thorn of lust, right? There comes a point, point where he, convert, he converts. He's soon after going to be, you know, a bishop not too long down the road, Bishop of Hippo. Um, once more, for anyone, FYI, that is why ever since 2019, I'm, I'm like lecture number 50 now. But my Hippo lectures once a month are called that, obviously, because of that, because he was Augustine of Hippo. That's why we're the Augustine Center, which is why, once more, you know, rejoicing. I'm so glad we're finally, you know, talking about our patron to such deep detail. If the earlier part of Confessions up to about Book 10 is so much thoughts about himself, personal things. Remember last class, Betsy, he asked, like, you know, are my Confessions going to even be um, valuable? Erica came to the class on Friday. We had great talks about, um, to the small breakout session on Friday, talks about 
that idea of like the self-help book and how that would help future generations like us, you know, reading his struggle with lust. The first, all of book 11 down through book 12, this idea of time, eternity, unity, um, God, God's relation to us, we working through time, so much takes up that discussion. I find it fascinating. I like kind of abstract stuff like that, but also can be, he can kind of be beating a dead horse. He says finally here, this is a good point on page 244, closing out book 11. The storms of incoherent events tear to pieces my thoughts, the inmost entrails of my soul, until that day when, purified and molten by the fire of your love, I flow together to merge into you. This is not, Augustine is a Catholic, he is a Christian. This is not this kind of Buddhist nirvana type thing, flow into one, one is all, not at all. But it means that beatific vision, right? The eternal stillness, the eternal happiness of non-ending frozen time in heaven with God. Listen to what Chadwick says in his footnote. I'll read the quote one more time, and I'll read the footnote. The storms of incoherent events tear to pieces my thoughts, the inmost entrails of my soul, to that day when purified and molten by the fire of your love, I flow together to merge into you. Footnote 31, Henry Chadwick. Augustine's image of the historical process is that of a flowing river or rivers with many stormy cataracts. So many different like tributaries, things branching off, but one flowing providential kind of grand river. I live in Pullman, like I said, we have Paradise Creek. It is not a grand river. I just wanted to mention that. It's not paradise. It should be called, like I have suggestions, Grimy Creek, Overrated Creek, Empty Beer Bottle Creek, um, Two Inch Deep Creek. When is a creek not a creek, but a puddle creek? I refuse to. It's really quite nice. I told people when I go on the bill. Right I told people when I go on the Bill Chipman Trail, I want trumpets, and they refuse to acknowledge that. So I've, I'm boycotting the trail. is very nice. You're exactly right. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's abs It's absolutely crazy beautiful. Yeah. If anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, I assume most people do. I assume everyone in this room and probably everyone in town knows this area better than I do. I'm six years into being a Palouse person. I hope I'm here forever, God willing. But so I'm not explaining anything new. People watching online, we have so many visitors. We have so many uh, watchers in Romania, actually. It's crazy, guys. Um, right now, the pre Mr. President, thank you so much. You honor us with your presence. The president of Romania is live streaming this to the whole country right now. Um, people in Romania don't know what the Palouse is like. So Paradise Creek, yeah, if you just leave Moscow right under the shadow of the Kibbe Dome, right, take that left across from Winkle, you can drive all the way to Pullman, seven miles or so, um, spinning you out on Bishop Boulevard. And I, no, I bet I agree with you. I, I'm being completely facetious. Paradise Creek is so super beautiful. Um, and that trail is just, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, that's, his, that's his view of time, of this kind of river. But for him, you know, it would be like a significant large river collecting all everything together and kind of flowing, but, but a river has a kind of telos, right? A lot of people credit Augustine with almost inventing time. The time isn't cyclical, but it has a purpose. It has a, a, a point towards which it's heading. And that's the book that you have there. The whole city of God is that all of time is ordered towards Christ's ultimate victory um, in heaven. And the river can be a good way of looking at that. Uh, his next book, he talked in book um, 12 now, the penultimate book of our Confessions discussion. We're almost there. I probably talked for like 10 more minutes. Um, I think if you look at, with Confessions now, we've done something like probably four hours in these three episodes, which is quite a lot. And from my count, I had 165 points that I mentioned, plus all the excellent comments you guys make ends up having this kind of spiral effect of probably over 200 individual kind of comments. It's, it's a, we've probably talked about Confessions adequately enough already. So I'll close up pretty soon. I also did an addendum to confessions that I'm going to post after this. So today, and you're watching now, I'm going to post this episode and send out a flock note and then an addendum episode that says, well, it's like eight minutes long, just like a chat, like freestyle chat. Like, hey, we finished confessions, guys. Here's what's coming up next with City of God. I really want to front load the class because I'm reading these two most important of his works. If people are getting them now, and again, thank you to those who watch later. If you are keeping up with the form of the class, once we get into his minor writings, if we can call them that, and I would qualify, you know, most things outside of Confessions and City of God minor in terms of certainly notoriety. You know, people who've read Augustine's almost always stops at City of God or Confessions, sadly. Dr. Burns is once more correct. Um, 
like the, the book that he suggested to that question at the talk, you know, starting with the commentary and the Sermon on the Mount, most known, probably if you haven't even heard of that. Once we get into the, you know, lesser known works, having gone through Confessions in the City of God and interiorized the stuff therein will be very, very helpful as kind of a springboard, springboard and kind of guide and whatever. We're almost done. Um, this book 12, Platonic and Christian Creation, Formless Matter, um, on page 251, book 12, quote, again, you said to me, Lord, with a loud voice to my inner ear, that you created all natures and substances which are, which are not what you are and nevertheless exist. The only thing that is not from you is what has no existence. Let me repeat. The only thing that is not from you is what has no existence. What is evil? He says about 100 pages earlier. It's the non-thing. It's the negative thing. That's why it's not from God. Evil is the non-existent thing. The person born with one arm instead of two, as we said, of course, duh, has done nothing wrong themselves. That is an evil done to them. In a certain, they're missing something that should be there. It should have two arms. And the two arms is not only normal, that's good. That's holy. That's how the creation should look. Um, so the only thing that is not from you is what has no existence. But all that is in existence, God brought it in. Why? Because of love. The movement of the will away from you who are is a movement towards that which has less being. It's amazing. The movement of the will away from you who are, God is the only one who is in and of himself, is a movement towards that which has less being. So every time we sin, we say, I want non-being. I want the not thing. I don't want the created thing. I don't want the thing full of life. I want the dead lacking thing. And is that not true? Why is it God bless all people God bless all people. You look at someone who's like struggled with like hard drugs or whatever, and they've like, they're 20, but they look like they're 50 years old kind of thing. Like God bless those people. That's exactly that. They've done so much non-being. It's sapped their very being, right? They've done so much away from being to those lesser things that are non-existent. Their own existence is slipping away in a certain sense. God created them to be full of life and vitality and look young and healthy. And they, in choosing these things, have deprived even their own life force, if that makes any sense. A movement of this nature is a fault and a sin. No one's sin harms you or disturbs the order of your rule, either on high or down below. In your presence, the truth is clear to me. Let it become more and more evident, I pray you, as it becomes manifest, may I dwell calmly under your wings. Guys, a movement of this nature is a fault and a sin. No one's, sins harm, no one's sin harms you. No one's sin harms you, O oh God. God is, the word is called, impassable. God is impassable. You can't hurt God. Oh, this atheist is going to go and like say all these bad words. God forbid. Bless him be God forever. You know, take God's name in vain. Just like these profane things. That'll make God mad. You can't make God mad. You can't. God is impassable. He can't be hurt. He's perfect. He's, he's untouchable in the best way. That is why, again, praise you, Jesus Christ. The incarnation is so beautiful. He allowed himself to be touched. Christ really suffered on the cross. He really felt pain and sorrow and hurt, Right? I think it's, it doesn't say in the Bible, like, he cried when Lazarus died. It's so beautiful, right? Like, here's the God of the universe feeling human sorrow because his friend was dead, and then he raised him from the dead. It's it's so awesome. Like, he cries, and he's like, okay, now, you know, now, you know. There's so much, I say comedy with the highest respect. There's so much amazing, I'm going to do a talk once on the comedy in the Gospels, and I mean it as, like, um, the old classic divine comedy, which divine comedy means not ha-ha so much as happy ending. There's so much stuff in the Gospels that's so funny. It makes you laugh out loud. Like St. Peter is so comedic, right? Lord, let me come to you, you know, and he just falls in the water. I will never deny you if he does it three times. You know, I'm going to cut this guy's ear off with a sword. Like he's just like, Peter's the freaking, they, it's so true. That kind of cliche, Christ couldn't find anyone worse. Like Peter's the freaking worst. If I was ever going to write a story about St. Peter, I'm serious. I say this with all the respect in, my, in, in the world. As a writer, I would never use God's name in vain. I take that very seriously. It's the first commandment. I would never even have my characters take God's name in vain. But I am all about, in the course of a story, like, well, if you're writing a story about like certain profane people, use that. I have no problem using the F word or whatever in like, you know, in, in stories. That's how I do St. Peter. Like St. Peter's a fisherman. I would have him be like the most vulgar, dirty joke, F, F, F bomb, whatever kind of guy. And you'd see over the course of this thing, like his conversion to that holier life. But he'd be like the one pope. There was a pope like Pius to something, Pius the Seventh, who apparently it was a very beautiful thing. Like he had a huge problem with dirty jokes and profanity. But he had to put a cross in every room to look and like, I'm sorry, Lord, and I'm gonna try to be better. It's actually it's funny, but also beautiful. Like he was aware of that. 
Like St. Peter is probably one of these guys. Every second word is the F word, cut a guy's ear off, you know. So, so Christ like comes into that, right? He comes into that to feel our humanity in the fullest way. And there's so much holy where you start laughing, you start crying, tears of gratitude, tears of joy out of love for God and the gospels. Um, but only because God becomes man in the incarnations is possible. God otherwise is impassable. Augustine did such a good job of showing how high and mighty God is in an age when everyone wants to be buddy, buddy. God is just your friend. He is your best friend. He's also God. Show some respect. This is why, like, I don't like getting into the Latin mass versus Novus Ordo debate. I 100%. If anyone would ever ask me, and no one's going to ask me, but if anyone did, actually, I should tell you guys, it wasn't the White House call before. It was Pope Francis. Him and I are on texting basis. <laughs> We're going to talk after this. I'm going to tell him, like, I would be all about bringing back communion rails everywhere. Everyone go up and kneel down, have the patent and, and on receive on the tongue. It's just very respectful. I don't want to get into, uh, again, I, I am not liberal or conservative. I'm just a Catholic. I don't want to get into the nonsense about every woman should be bailed at mass or not. It's none of my business. What does the church say? It's, I, I, my, my opinion counts for zero. But I do like the things that like show God respect. God is above all majesty, the, the divine Lord. He is our best friend. But he's not just buddy, buddy, our friend. And Augustine does a great job of his book of showing that. God is not only the non-contingent, uh, self-subsistent being. He is the, the greatest, the most grand. And even if you wanted to hurt him, you can. Our, our sin doesn't hurt him. It hurts us, right? So, you know, we should avoid being self-destructive. Um, page 255, book 12 still. We do not find the time existed before this created realm. For wisdom was created before everything. Obviously, it does not mean your wisdom, our God, Father, the created wisdom. Your wisdom is manifestly co-eternal and equal with you, by whom all things were created and is the beginning in which you made heaven and earth. God's wisdom, his divine wisdom, his divine logos, second person, Holy Trinity, Christ himself, obviously, co-eternal, consubstantial, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I think we should pray for wisdom. I, I encourage you all, read, that's your homework assignment. Read the book of wisdom, especially chapter nine, Solomon's prayer for wisdom. Um, it's so good. It's a beautiful prayer. It's like we should be praying for wisdom. Um, I'm not being nice again. You all, you people in this room might be a hundred times more wise than I am. So I have no like lessons to dole out. I'm simply saying, is it not true that, you know, someone could be like very book smart or street smart, but being wise is something even more additional, right? It's something like some, showing how to use that. Like, I, I'm very street smart, and I own this, like, you know, brand business of used car stuff, whatever. But wisdom tells me how I can not rip people off and how to grease the right palms in the right way and customers. Like, it's something more than just, like, knowing how to sell cars, right? Seems safer than praying for humility. Right. <laughs> That's a great comment. Loretta, quote, it seems safer than praying for humility, end quote, meaning wisdom. Yeah. No, sure. Um, pray for humility. <laughs> you get opportunities. You get humble, right? You get opportunities to get wisdom. Maybe you just get wisdom. I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> um, very. I love this. It's a great comment. Um, I say this all the time. What is the opposite of funny, guys? Anyone know? People always mess this up. What is the opposite of funny? Mm. I can, the answer is like that. The most famous answer is, anyone know? What's the opposite of funny? People say serious. Not funny. Yeah, the opposite of funny is not funny. And like, it's, it's like true. Like a person can be serious and funny. That comment was serious and funny. It was very funny, very serious, very good. The worst combination would be to be not serious and not funny, right? Like at least you're going to be not funny, but you're seriously, but if you're like, if you're both, that's double fail. Um, but maybe in praying for wisdom, we can be both funny and serious. Um, and I find so much that in kind of the great spiritual masters, even some of the desert fathers have a great sense of humor. There's nothing like opposed to holiness or seriousness in humor. It's just, I guess, you know, the right times and, and whatever it may be. Um, Augustine certainly himself, right? God's majesty is not funny. It's not a trivial matter. It is something very much to ponder upon though. And I think a large part of his back end of this book, 11, 12, and 13 dealing with time, God being outside of time, is meant as kind of a ponderance on that. I'm really going to sit with that idea of, you know, God's ridiculous grandeur. Ridiculous is like in an enormous quantity. 
God is so much greater than we can even kind of fathom, kind of thought. Um, what else they say here? Really coming, you know, coming down to the conclusion around book 13, final book here. Uh, Even if the creation had either never come into existence or remained formless, nothing could be lacking to the good which you, you are to yourself. You made it not because you needed it, but from the fullness of your goodness, imposing control and converting it to receive form. The corollary of your perfection is that the imperfection of created things is displeasing. Another point on God's grandeur, God didn't make the world because he needs us. Again, these atheists, and yeah, no, I think atheist is absolutely like expletive deleted, expletive deleted again. I think it's awful. You know, I pray all people be given the grace, the light to, to not be atheists. I'm not trying to like rip people and be sarcastic, but like this is one of those more, there are some like interesting atheist arguments. There are some like, like the best atheist argument, like Albert Camus talked about, you know, without God, all is absurd. If God doesn't exist, there is no right or wrong. Just do whatever you want. Just go to the beach. And just because I mean, that's, that's a good argument. That, that's Dostoevsky said the same thing. Without God, all is permitted. If you don't believe in God, don't talk about right and wrong. What are you talking about? Then it's like Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa are just people who did stuff. What are you talking about right or wrong? They just did things. Like we're just all atoms doing things. So those are kind of more sophisticated atheistic arguments. But some of the dumbest ones are like, well, you know, God needs us. We don't need him. It's like God doesn't need anything. God is perfectly self-subsistent happy in himself. If anyone's ever had a perfect moment with their family, imagine like it's just, you know, you and your spouse and your child or whatever, and you're like camping or something just away from it all. And you're like, this moment could just be like this forever. Just us. I don't want any of anyone else. That's God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, perfect love, perfect joy forever. Like he doesn't need any of us. We need him. So why did God make the world? Because he loves us, because he's good, because he wants to share it with us. He wants to invite us to this party. Hence why atheism is to a violation of that first commandment. We're not, Atheists don't even thank him for all the goodness. Oh, I, I don't need God. I just have the ocean, my surfboard. Well, who gave you that, you freaking moron? Right? Like, who, God, you're, you're using what God gave you without saying thank you even. And all he wants you to do is tell him thank you, right, for the ocean and the surfboard, which can be a form of prayer in a sense. Absolutely. Go first to Mass. Make your Sunday obligation. Pray the rosary. But if you surf all day on Sundays, you can be, that can be a way of praising God. For, for, but you have, to, you have to thank him, right? They, they thank you for this ocean, this thing, this everything. God doesn't need us. We need him. And we need to thank him. And then he says, Augustine, we're going to talk about Augustine on the Trinity. That previous one was page. Do you have the same issue? Yes. Uh, 275. Second paragraph. Creation's overflow and return. Roman numeral four, inset five, second paragraph. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then page 279, 11 Roman numeral, and then 12 inset. Who can understand the omnipotent trinity? And then he goes down to the bottom, three aspects of self. But these, um, I wish that human disputants would reflect upon the triad, triad in their own selves. These three aspects of the self are very different from the trinity, but I may make the observation that on this triad, they can well exercise their minds and examine the problem, thereby becoming aware how far distant they are from it. The three aspects I mean are being, knowing, and willing. So he's like, in our triad, as he calls it, of being, knowing, and then willing or acting and deciding to do stuff, obviously, right? Um, that in some ways, you know, mirrors, however, in a pale sense, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet every grand Catholic thinker, Augustine himself, has talked about the ununderstandability, the incomprehensible nature of the Trinity. It's the ultimate mystery, right? In fact, I think that the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the Catechism says, is the central mystery of the Christian faith. It is the most mysterious most eyes not seen, ears not heard. Hence the grand hope of the beatific vision. You'll see God as he is and like and understand it. And in your glorified resurrected body, be given the grace to, to comprehend the glory of that. And you'll want to look at nothing else for all eternity because it's so glorious and grand. Um, last point, guys. Last point, 289. I'm done. I'm going to throw this book up in the air. I promise I'll do it. I'm going to throw this book up in the air and, and try to do this. It'd be so sick. I'm going to throw it up in the air to signify closing. It'll leave the screen and hopefully it'll descend back down to the screen. That'll be so sweet. I'll see if I can pull it off. Last thing I'm doing before I throw the book. Signs and Sacraments, Betsy, page 289, second paragraph, 28. 
All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. That's where I want to finish. All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. A third time, I will read it. I do declare it. Whoa. All things are beautiful because you made them, but you who made everything are inexpressibly more beautiful. It worked. It went up and down. Perfect. Uh, on that point, um, that's a great place to end. I am obsessed with the idea of beauty in terms of evangelization. In my Hippo Lectures book, I purposely put a zero level chapter. Like when that book came out, it was all the talks I've done, the Hippo Lectures kind of in chronological order, basically. But I purposely had level zero be on beauty. A talk that I gave very recently, I think like last year or a year and a half. But I wanted to lead with beauty. It's the story of this, this guy and this girl and whatever. In my most recent Hippo Lecture, which is a six part set on Augustine, which is going to be a book entitled when it finishes come May, like postmodern Augustine or something. It's told through anyone who attended the Hippo Lecture is seen online. It's told through the um, prism of two models, this guy, Mark and Anna, and they fall in love and Father LeBron, their priest. And uh, purposely, I, I have them like Anna and Mark are these two impossibly high levels of physical beauty, a man and a woman. And yet how pale is that compared to the beauty of the soul and God's inexpressible beauty? And I very much am interested in that idea of like the lesser beauties, whether it's in a person's attractiveness, how well they sing, how well they play an instrument, their baking ability. Um, someone running a town well as a mayor could be a beautiful thing, right? They're, they're incredible at delegating, whatever. All these lesser beauties point to God, the ultimate beauty himself. On that note, goodbye, guys. Watch how fast I sign this off. Bonjour tout le monde, uh, permettez-moi à dire merci, merci à vous mille fois. Je suis extrêmement reconnaissant de votre soutien indéfectible de ce programme Maple Syrup History um, et j'espère un jeu, c'est possible pour moi, à faire un épisode de Maple Syrup History exclusivement en français avec les sous-titres en, en, en anglais. Parce que sans vous, sans, sans votre soutien, ce programme ne compte rien. Et euh, quand j'avais dit dans ce passé, pour moi, il n'y a rien. Dire le français, c'est le plus bel homme dans l'histoire de l'humanité. Et chaque fois, chaque opportunité à faire quelque chose n'importe quoi en français, ça c'est une bonne chose et, et il me faut faire ça. Encore une fois, en bref. Pour votre soutien, pour, 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 pour tous, merci, merci mille fois, mes amis.